I'm a little soft spoken, so I know I have to uh, project better. Um, so Alfonso started us in the Bay Area of California, and I'm taking you to the Bay State of Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> I am a quality assurance supervisor and also a recruitment supervisor. In the last two and a half years, I started recruiting, uh, supervising three recruiters in our region. Um, the state uh, uh, hired a recruiters specifically just to do recruitment and took it out of the area offices and brought it to our regional offices. So we were uh, assigned three and I uh, supervise them currently. And what, um, the reason I chose this is because one of my uh, the recruiters um, started doing her recruitment work with faith-based organizations. And in the last two and a half years, I've seen all the great work that she has done. And um, not just recruiting uh, families, uh, but also establishing additional supports for our area offices in the region. So um, what I wanted to do is the similar work that she was doing, and also, but also do it specifically with um, faith-based organizations of color. Um, uh, that's where uh, her, the need was. Um, so this is how I decided to um, work with faith-based organizations. So um, I'll talk about the identified issues, the plan of action that I took, and what uh, my expected outcomes were, which I thought that all the faith-based organizations were going to come crawling and want to help, um, <laughs> and help with uh, the need of recruiting and having more resources for children. And I'll show, um, I'll speak about some research, the research that I did and what I found helpful in, um, for my ARRP. And we'll take a look at where Massachusetts is now and where specifically in, in my region. I know a lot of folks in the bigger states who talk about um, counties, um, but uh, we divide our areas in regards to regions. And then within the regions, we have um, a different number of offices in the northern, I'm from the northern regional office. And we have eight area offices um, cover um, that specific area. And we'll talk about the uh, two strategies that I um, uh, d completed, and um, we'll look at the assessment and the lessons that I learned, and I'll write off with a conclusion. Um, so, I mean, we know everybody has talked about and we've learned since the beginning of um, the fellowship um, and the reasons why the fellowship exists is because um, we know that uh, there's a disproportionality of children of color in our own states um, and they um, have disparate outcomes, they last longer in foster care, um, they're the least to reach permanency. So, in, um, and I know like um, Alfonso shared in April that um, there's a great need for resources, so, and I know we're, everyone's in the same boat, right? And so we all need resources um, and need to recruit more. And my belief was, from what I saw in my recruiter, that um, what the work that she was doing, um, that there was also an untapped um, area or resources within the faith-based organizations of color. And um, it would, I, my belief was that it would di diversify the recruitment work. Um, so again, my plan of action was to um, reach out to the faith-based communities of color, and um, I thought that I would uh, reach out to them because we know that faith-based organizations um, already believe in serving and caring for um, the vulnerable children and um, and their families, and many of the organizations um, make it their, their mission to do this work. So um, I wanted to identify uh, the faith-based organizations within um, our region. I uh, wanted uh, 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 faith-based organizations that resemble the children right now that are in, in care. Um, of the department, and my belief was that they would affirm and maintain time, ties 
um, cultural ties for the children, um, if they were placed with families that looked like them, that spoke the same language, um, et cetera. And, and I wanted to build and create partnerships um, with the faith-based organization. So <clears throat> again, I thought that um, all the faith-based organizations were going to be crawling and wanted um, to create um, uh, foster care initiatives and adoption initiatives within their um, uh, faith-based organization. Um, I definitely um, uh, believe that uh, they would have an increased knowledge of the needs of the children that uh, were in care and are in care and that waiting for permanency. And um, I also expected that we would recruit more foster and adoptive homes for our children. And then that would eventually lead to uh, the increased permanency for children of color. Um, so the research that I did um, spoke about a lot of the uh, collaboration efforts in two specific um, states in Colorado and Arkansas. And what I read was that they were successful in um, sharing the needs of uh, children in care and um, their need for permanency as well as uh, the need for more foster and adoptive parents. Um, they also spoke about that they had a greater awareness of those needs uh, because of the faith-based organization in, their, in that particular faith-based um, organization um, and project in, within their state. And they also helped with the recruitment of foster and adoptive families. And the examples that we're gonna look at are Project 127 out of Colorado and The Call in Arkansas. Um, the, the articles um, that I found, the only two evidence-based uh, articles that I found uh, were by the same author, and he in both serve, it's ser articles, um, he did surveys with uh, both, uh, both of the groups and then did a second survey that compared um, the foster and adoptive parents uh, within these uh, organizations and compared that to a national sample um, that I think one these wonderful kids did. So um, the faith-based um, initiatives called Project 127 in Colorado and The Call, um, they created more foster parent awareness and the knowledge of need and the intent. Um, for instance, before uh, individuals were exposed to the initiatives or the programs, um, they indicated that 59% were unaware or somewhat aware. And then when they were exposed to the programs, that 98% were aware of the need for families and the need that children have. So, <clears throat> also, um, what um, uh, what I thought was important here that in pro with Project One Two Seven is that sixty seven percent were not serious about foster care or becoming adoptive parents, and after they were exposed to the program and heard of the need, that fifty percent were seriously considering in becoming a foster or adoptive parent. And then with the call, 66% um, were not serious, and after exposure to that particular program, that 64% were seriously considered in, considering in becoming a foster adoptive parent. Um, so in the second survey, uh, this, uh, which compared the satisfaction in comparison to um, the foster and adoptive families involved with these two initiatives compared to um, the national sample, um, they, almost all the families um, had a higher percentage rate of satisfaction in the three phases of retention, which are initial contact with the agency and licensure, time between licensure and placement, and the period after placement. All the families felt that um, they had a positive experience and that the agencies were uh, much more attentive to their needs and aware of their needs. And um, the numbers that were provided was that 76% um, 70 of the families involved with Project 1 to 7 and 50% of the families involved with the call were um, satisfied with the response that they received compared to 24% of the national sample. 
I also found in my research that there are um, potential barriers um, that uh, when we're working with faith-based organizations, for instance, incompatible police values or methods, negative relationship history, and questions about cultural or faith competence. Sometimes, you know, uh, faith-based organizations could um, already have experienced the agency or the department in a negative way, and that might impact uh, the work moving forward. Whatever the potential barriers are, these are just three that I named here, there are many more, um, that those barriers need to be addressed and talked and worked through before moving forward. Um, I also found an article that spoke uh, about the impact when faith-based organizations, those relationships that already existed in certain states, how um, it impacted the children of their state when um, the relationship had to end. Um, in one state, uh, there was a replacement of two to 3,000 children. Um, in a second state, which was my state in Massachusetts, there was a, a request and approval of 50% more um, over capacity waivers when those children had to be re uh, replaced. And then in a third state, um, there was a replacement of about 700 children that they had to go into group home settings because of the relationship with the faith-based organizations had to end or end it. Um, my research also, there were some gap and limitations. What I found that um, there were only two evidence-based uh, articles that I found in regards to the, um, uh, the effectiveness of the relationship of faith-based organizations and agencies. And um, they were by the same author. And um, the, one of the surveys that uh, he completed, um, which when Alfonso talked about this, about um, some of the, um, the gaps that a lot of the families were white, uh, that's what I also found in the surveys, that um, there were demographic and socioeconomic differences. Um, they, the families involved with the two faith-based initiatives, um, there was a higher number of white families, um, and they had higher incomes, um, they had more education. So it just, um, made me think about other things um, and how, uh, you know, more work or maybe another ARP some uh, the time or something. Um, <laughs> so um, we'll take a look at Massachusetts, where Massachusetts um, is or was in 20, 2015. Um, the first two columns that you see here um, talk about the census um, in regards to race and ethnicity and the percentage of the children. And the last few columns you will see um, in fiscal year 2015 in Massachusetts, the percentage of children that came to the attention of the, of the department or child victims, their rate of disproportionality, the percentage of children that came into care at the end of that fiscal year, their rate of disproportionality, and then the percentage of adopted <coughs> children in Massachusetts for that fiscal year. So I don't know if you're able to see, but I, I bolded the numbers where there was um, uh, the rate of disproportionality where either they were uh, represented at a higher rate or um, overly, um, there was an, a disproportionate amount over the normal number of 1.0 or if it, um, under 1.0 where they were underrepresented. The ones that stood out were um, the black children and the Hispanic of any race. Um, in Massachusetts, the black children, um, they're at 8.3%, but they come, into, come to the attention of the department at a higher rate, 12.6%, and which the rate of disproportionality is 1.5. They um, represent 14.5% uh, of the children in care, um, and that rate of disproportionality is 1.7, um, and they are also, the percentage of the black children adopted are 8.2, and then you see how the underrepresentation of um, for them being adopted at 0.7. There are some similarities um, for the Hispanic children. Um, there is a higher um, percentage community of Hispanic children, um, but they also have similar numbers in regards to the percentage of child victims, those that come to the attention of the department and um, their adoption rate, so. 
<clears throat> Here you will see um, foster children with the goal of adoption, and this is just specific for the regional office where I work in, so those eight area offices. Um, uh, we have 530 children with the goal of adoption. This was as of March 2019. This, that's when I was collecting that specific information. Um, 226 are, are white children, five children um, Ameri American Indian or Alaskan Native, and 28 um, black children, and then there were uh, 181 um, children of, uh, that were described as Hispanic of any race, and then 66 multiracial. I did omit, if you see, um, there's certain, um, there's not information covered here in regards to um, the Asian population, and as well, I had a lot of information when, um, in regards to the numbers that were unable to determine. Um, so I omitted that information and just concentrated on, on these four groups. So our finalized adoptions um, in this current fiscal year, and as of March 2019, was 115. 61 of them were white children. Um, zero were American Indian or Alaskan Native. There were only three black children and 26 Hispanic children, and then 13 children that were um, multiracial. And um, this graph speaks to our resources uh, that would like to adopt children or pre-adoptive resources in our northern uh, regional office. Right now we have 139 approved homes, 67 are white, zero are American Indian, two black homes, and eight Hispanic homes, and zero multiracial homes. The light blue shaded area is, uh, are unable to determine. Um, that made me think of, um, I know this presents a large gap, and um, that just made, gave me other ideas of how can we better um, document that information so we can have a better picture of what is um, what we have, what our, our resources look like. So I'm working on that with our uh, adoption supervisors. In this last slide, um, this uh, the is a comparison of the previous slides, um, so you can have a better picture of where the numbers are in regards to American Indian, the Black Hispanic children, uh, multiracial and white. And for the purposes of, of my ARP, I decided to concentrate on um, Black and Hispanic. Um, communities or faith-based organizations of color because that's where like, predominantly where um, the numbers show that there was a greater need. So one of the strategies that um, I created with the help of um, my team was a seven question survey. And um, the survey I sent off electronically as well as snail, snail mail and so um, the seven questions ask the faith-based organizations of color um, what their level of awareness needs um, of children of color in their particular community, the need of, of foster parents of color in their community, um, what the process were, were they aware of what the process looked like to become a resource uh, in, in foster care or, or adoption, and if they were aware of any other faith-based organizations um, that were involved um, and worked with agencies. And also that they were, uh, the last two questions spoke, uh, asked them if they were interested in learning more of those processes and if they were interested in partnering. Um, as they completed the, the surveys and as I, when I sent off the, the surveys, I started collecting in the, the information that you saw in the previous slides because I wanted to um, show them that information. And so I provide, uh, to provide specific information of what our, our resources already look like and what the children in their communities look like. Um, so what I, what, with the help of <coughs> Sharon Lynn, um, we had to identify a faith-based organization. She gave me a number um, to work with um, 
to try to work specifically or go out and meet five faith-based organizations. Um, I also, um, my, uh, the second strat strategy was to work with the recruiters that I supervised and the teams, the recruitment teams that already existed in the area offices to um, use their own connections um, to work with or to identify faith-based organizations um, that would um, would be become partners in uh, creating resources and creating the uh, awareness for um, the need. So I um, I had a list to work 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 from in regards to um, black. Um, faith-based communities in the greater Boston area, and I went, I used the internet to identify um, Hispanic uh, faith-based organizations. I sent out a total of 48 um, electronically and also snail mail, and I um, had one online completed survey um, and two snail mail surveys that were returned, so not um, a good uh, outcome of the survey. <clears throat> but um, in the action in the action research project, um, I was able to have three partnership meetings um, with faith faith organizations where um, we met and presented and discussed and discussed with the leaders of the needs um, that the community had and. Um, they, we presented on the material that we would um, be able to share, and um, we also included them, or they, they would um, let us know how they would like to move forward. Um, and so from there, we started, um, we had three presentations and, or informational meetings, and in the first faith, faith organization, um, the leader presented during the service. Um, that they were they were able to share that somebody from the agency was going to be present um, and be able to um, do a presentation and discuss uh, the needs that were in the community and the need for foster and adoptive resources. <coughs> so in the first faith-based organization, there were over 300 people. Um, two informational meetings were com uh, were completed after. Um, the services and they included 90 people from that um, we received six inquiries which people that expressed interest and then um, that also moved forward in the application process the second faith-based organization um, had 20 people um, during the informational session and we received four inquiries and applications from um, that meeting and then the third faith-based organization um, the recruiters were able to set up after uh, the, the services and they shared information with um, five people that showed interest. So um, within these faith-based organizations and we were able to create new established relationships and we were able to move forward um, with the applicant and the inquiries which I learned also that needed con <coughs> excuse me, consistent follow-up um, because the leaders of the faith-based organizations were interested in knowing where <coughs> those individuals were. And if, if um, meeting with the, the department and the recruiters um, provided uh, was helpful. I, um, Addie also, um, Addie, um, Sharon also suggested for me to go back um, to one of the faith-based organizations and ask them um, these questions. Um, so what made them get involved? What can um, they share with other faith-based organizations about the experience? What else can the department do to help um, additional faith-based organizations get involved? And what um, in initial things are the most important in order to be successful? And what uh, the leader was able to share is that it made it easier for them to be involved because they already had two uh, approved foster parents that attended that organization and that had active placements. So um, one in particular who works closely with one of the recruiters, she's very passionate about this as well. So she was the one that initiated those conversations with her leaders. 
and um, she shared her passion that she wanted to, to spread the word with her organization. And the leader was very open, um, met with, um, with us, um, wanted to know what information we were gonna share, and then um, presented um, in the, um, to the organization itself and we were able to meet with them. Um, she did find that very helpful. She also found helpful that um, the particular information of the numbers of the resources and the children in care, um, that was very um, significant to her and um, she said that that would help moving forward. So um, what I learned in the process is that um, if we first what I learned in um, the research that I completed, um, they talked about gatekeepers, and um, what I noticed is where I, where we were able to go into faith-based organizations and meet with the organizations is when there were um, gatekeepers already um, existing. So they, they was a foster parent. Um, the other organizations were. Um, it was um, a social worker already that worked in one of the area offices that she was able um, to help and be a bridge um, for us. And um, I learned that there are you know, different approaches to obtain data. Sometimes we, start, um, we started with a, sp a specific focus um, and I was you know, working on the survey and um, you know, sweating about the survey, and, and every month Sharon's like, oh no, only one still. <laughs> um, so, but in the meantime, all this other work was happening, and so I'm like, wait, it's happening already, it's just happening in a different way. So, um, I'm not sure if um, the survey was the best approach for um, starting to initiate relationships with faith-based organizations that are unknown. Um, and I did put cultural barriers here, but I think um, after rereading the, the research, um, it, I could have described it better, maybe cultural um, differences or different cultures, um, where, um, for instance, in the, the Hispanic, uh, community, a faith-based organization, um, we're people person, so um, we like to interact face-to-face that -face, uh, maybe I could have approached them in a different way. So this is my, this um, is my PICO, a faith-based organizations and communities of color in the Northeast region of Massachusetts participate in activities designed to increase engagement, communication, and intentional partnerships for the purposes of recruitment of foster and adoptive homes, will it result in increased knowledge and recruitment efforts with the goal of increasing permanency for children of color currently experiencing the foster care system? Um, this is a long one. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm probably in the middle um, right now. Um, you know, when I looked at uh, the results of the survey and then the results of um, what happened um, naturally and organically uh, through already existing relationships, and you can say both things. Um, no, I didn't, it didn't work maybe in the survey, but it's, it is working with already those pre-existing um, relationships through those gatekeepers and those bridges already. Um, so, and it's something that I will continue working on. I'm very passionate about this. And um, now uh, we're also hiring additional recruiters um, and I've made it a point to uh, uh, um, hire folks that also represent the children that would probably have um, maybe, I don't want to say easier access, but if they look like the faith-based organization, that um, the faith-based organizations will be more willing and, and open their doors um, more willingly. So, um, again, the different approaches um, that I think would have helped that and I could have added here is used our family resource liaisons or ambassadors, they are hired by the department, they're active um, foster and adoptive parents that are uh, uh, provide support to already licensed resources, and our ambassadors help 
um, with the recruitment of new families and individuals. And um, Sharon Lynn wanted me to go to 48 faith-based organizations of color, so all the services and knock on their door. I don't know if I can do that. Um, but yes, I could have done it maybe to some, for some, um, and maybe it would have produced other um, outcomes. So um, also I learned that um, when we create those new relationships, it's important to um, have regular contact with them. I found that in the families that move forward with the increase in um, applications that I ended up calling every, um, about every two weeks just to make sure where they were at, if they had any questions, do they need help um, completing the application and so on. So, and again, I added the cultural factor, <coughs> but it, like again, the cultural differences that I mentioned in the previous slide about, um, you know, knowing that faith-based organization, knowing um, what uh, their, their values and um, their vision and their mission, and also um, identifying ways to um, better, uh, to get in the door, have a door, um, get in the door to the faith-based organization. What did work was the, the bridges, um, the gatekeepers, um, the folks that, the foster parents, our um, social workers. Am I, do I have time? Yeah. Um, <laughs> just checking. Um, so that's what worked um, for us. Um, the project itself provided an opportunity for me to grow as a leader. Um, to really share this, what I've learned and in the project itself with the recruiters that I supervise. Um, it, was, it provided an opportunity to also replicate some of that work with uh, faith-based uh, organizations of color and to go into different diverse communities. And it also, also to be intentional about the recruitment of, um, of diverse families for our kids. Um, this ex the whole experience, I, you know, looking back, I'm like, oh, I don't know how I, I worked for 21 years. Um, <laughs> not like being intentional and knowing all this information. So it's really inspired me and it's instilled new skills, especially with the transformational leadership, um, being part of the calls and the webinars and the coaches specifically about um, transformational leadership. It confirmed for me work that I was already doing, but also I was able to learn more and um, put those into um, action with, um, with my team. I've also shared with um, all the supervisors in, in my office, and um, we have group supervision, and I was able to share a lot of the great articles in regards to transformational leadership, um, and that's been very helpful. Um, this experience has provided for me a broader um, perspective and the importance of um, working to improve the outcomes for our kids. And it created a new team or a network within you guys. I've learned a lot. I've learned from not only um, uh, what we read, but also in the call that we had monthly. Um, I've picked up on certain things that already exist in your states that I would like to share with our leadership team and hopefully um, I can see things um, change in different ways too and not just um, with my project. Um, I want to end with this African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone, if you want to go far, go together. One of the articles um, said that agency and um, we, they can't do it alone, we can't do it alone, that we need um, other uh, agencies to help out. Our kids come from all different communities, so we should be able to go into the different communities and recruit.